Bibles out and your outlines out as we continue in our series on the Revelation. Now, if you've not been with us for uh, the last few chapters, let me just share with you, we are walking through the book of the Revelation and we have come to chapter 4. In just a few moments, we'll be getting into that chapter. Let me just uh, remind you up to this point what uh, has taken place. Because whenever you come to chapter 4, we come to some visions that are going to take place. John is being ushered up into the very presence of God. But in the very first part of Revelation, you remember God spoke to John and he told John to write in three ways. The things that have been, the things that are, and the things that will take place. Now, the things that he has seen, you remember in chapter 1, John was given a picture of the glorified Christ. If you want to get the best biblical picture of Jesus Christ, go to Revelation chapter 1. John just simply unfolds his glory, his majesty, his appearance. If you go back to the Gospels, you get the humanity picture of Jesus veiled in flesh on this earth. But when you come to chapter uh, 1 in Revelation, you come to that picture that John is given, that wonderful, glorious picture of the Christ. And then, when you come to chapters 2 and 3, which is the church age, John is given to write the things which are, that is, the church age. You know, the church age is now. Uh, You and I are living in the church age. In the Old Testament, you'll never find the word church. You'll never find any word like the church because the church was still hidden in the heart of God and was a mystery. That's why uh, uh, whenever you're looking in the Old Testament for church-related things, you won't find them there because the church, the word ecclesia, was used by Jesus in the Gospel of Matthew. And so those things which are, and you'll have seven distinct separate churches. Those are seven churches, literal churches in Asia Minor, which is Turkey now, but also seven churches which symbolize the church age until the church is gone from the earth. Now let me say, the church is going to vanish from the earth. The church is going to be taken up. You find it in John, you find it in Corinthians, you find it in Thessalonians, that the church is going to be taken up. And so when we come to chapter 4 of Revelation, we come to that chapter where the church is already gone. Uh, someone asked, uh, where is where's the departure of the church? And I heard a good godly theologian say, look in those spaces between chapter 3 and chapter 4 of Revelation and you'll find the church is gone. Why do I say that? Because after chapter 4, you'll never hear the word church mentioned. You'll never see anything regarding the church. Why? Because the church is gone. And so when you open the Bible and you come to Revelation chapter 4, you'll notice, as I mentioned, the church isn't mentioned anymore. The church is gone. And so uh, from... Revelation 4 to Revelation chapter 19, what is taking place is everything on the earth in the unfolding as the church is taken up in the presence of the Lord, we're going to be rewarded. We're going to be rewarded by the Lord based on what we've done with our life, our time, our energy, and our talents as the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. But on earth, it's going to be a different scene. God is reigning His wrath. He's reigning His fury on a godless world that has turned away from Him. And so you have uh, seven years of great tribulation. And then whenever the great tribulation is over, the Lord Jesus Christ will come for a thousand year reign. And we're going to be very explicit about that. Why do I say that? Because you need to read the revelation like you would have read all the other 65 books of the Bible. It's amazing how whenever I've read some uh, scholars and some commentaries, they say you can't understand revelation. Well, God would not give us a book and then not want us to understand it as best we could by the power of His Holy Spirit. And uh, God didn't give us things that are going to take place in the end for us not to understand. The problem is we sort of fancy away a lot of what Revelation does say. So I want you to follow along very carefully. And of course the scene from chapter 4 and 5, John is taken up into heaven. You remember in the very opening words, we're going to look at it in a moment. But the Lord says, come up here. And when the Lord says, come up here, you're going to come up. But, uh, and so chapter 4 and chapter 5, as a matter of fact, all throughout Revelation, John is seeing uh, so much of what's going to happen on the earth from a heavenly vantage point. Now, this is not something esoteric, unreal that, that John is seeing, but it's very real. And it's couched in the best language that he can use in the day and time. Remember, he's trying to communicate what he's seeing with the language that he has in that day and time, which would be the Koine Greek. 
Uh, Koine simply means the common language. Uh, and so that's what the New Testament was written in. And so John is going to see the chronology from God's vantage point of what's going to take place after the church is gone from the earth. Now, let me say this and say, well, how do we as Christians believe? Well, let me tell you what I believe according to Scripture. I am pre-tribulation. Now, what does that mean? Well, I believe that the church is going to go before the tribulation because you can't find anything in the Old Testament that says that we're going to be around or the New Testament. For example, you look back in the uh, book of Genesis and uh, Noah and his family was spared and then the wrath of God came. Lot was spared and then God's uh, wrath came upon Sodom and Gomorrah. So you remember what Jesus said, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the coming of the Son of Man. We're going to be taken up. We're going to be taken up in the rapture. On the very day the rapture takes place is the beginning process of God's wrath going to be reigned. There will be seven years until the Messiah comes literally upon the earth to rule and reign. Now, let me just mention a couple of things. First of all, the church will disappear from the earth. Notice in your outline. The church will disappear from the earth. Now, it's no accident that, uh, you know, it's not mentioned there. When chapter 4 opens, the church is gone. In Revelation chapter 2 and 3, Jesus takes great pain to talk about that church and to encourage them to make an impact. Why? Because we're going to be going. We're going to be leaving this world. We're going to be moving out. And so the church is gone in chapter 3, at the end of chapter 3. And uh, now remember, the church doors will not be closed. Churches will still be meeting, but the genuine, authentic, born-again believers will be gone. Now, there may be a lot of church buildings that continue. People still come and they still do something. But the children of God, the saints of God, will be gone. And uh, the word rapture, now you say, well, where does the Bible say rapture? The, The word rapture is not found in the New Testament. You say, well, how can you preach and teach on the rapture? Because it is there. The word rapture or repair, which comes from the Latin, is in the New Testament. And the word is catching away. In the book of Acts, the word is harpazio. The word harpazio means to be caught away. And we're going to be harpazio. You remember there's also a picture of that in Acts. You remember when uh, Philip preached to the uh, Ethiopian eunuch? After Philip preached to that uh, Ethiopian eunuch, he was harpazio. Now somebody's going to hear me say that he was harpooned. I'm not saying harpoon. Somebody's going to say, no, harpazio means caught away. And he was at Azotus, which is about 17 to 20 miles away. And he realized he was in a different location. So you're going to be caught up. We're going to be raptured. And so uh, the church, uh, you know, there's going to be uh, churches that are going to meet because they're false churches. There's a lot of false churches that meet on Sunday morning. They say something, they teach something, but they don't teach and preach the word of God. And you're only a genuine believer if you placed your faith in God through Jesus Christ through the shed blood. There is no such thing as a Christian that is a, just a nice moral person. You're not saved by being moral. You're not saved by being nice or kind. You're saved by the shed blood of Jesus Christ. So, uh, and, and let me remind us, uh, those of us who are part of the church, the word definition church is ecclesia. I love this because the Lord is so logical. The word ecclesia means, uh, you know, literally means called out of the world. Get this. You have been called out of the world, out of the world that you, that is of unbelievers. You have responded by the grace of God. You've responded to the working of the Holy Spirit. And the word is ecclesia. You've been called out of the world, and then you're going to be called out of the world. I mean, the Lord is so simple and so logical, you know. And so that's the reality. Well, number two, the church must disappear. From the earth. You say, well, what do you mean it must disappear? Well, in writing to the churches, Paul declared in 1 Corinthians 15, 51, he said, behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. What do you mean by being changed? We're going to be receiving a glorified body at God's timing. You may not die. Do you know that? You may not die. You say, well, now God says it's appointed unto man once to die. Well, there's going to be a generation that's going to be alive when the rapture takes place. You and I might be that. I want to I want to think that. It may not be so, but it could very well be. And so, not every generation is going to die. There's going to be a living generation when Jesus Christ comes to rapture the church. And so, John is being given a picture, being transported into heaven, and he's going to see things that are going to take place. And the call of John is to come up hither. It's a picture of what will happen to God's children from the earth. Now, let me, let me say this. 
When you get to Revelation chapter 4, this is not the picture of the rapture. God is isolating John. He said, John, I want you to come up here and I'm going to show you what's going to take place. And he's seeing the throne room of God. Now, if you'll notice, every one of us who are children of God, we can't face wrath. When we are raptured, we are escaping the wrath of God to come on the world. Now, you cannot be here for the wrath of God. It is impossible for the church of the Lord Jesus Christ to be on this earth for the wrath of God. Why? Because you and I have passed from death unto life. Look in Romans chapter 5 verse 9. I think it's on your overhead. Much more then, being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved, say that next word with me, from wrath. We shall be saved from wrath through him. What that means? You're not going to be here for the great tribulation. The great tribulation is designed for the wrath of God, the day of the Lord, which is a reference to judgment. And so you and I aren't going to be here. And so God makes it very clear. He's reigned his wrath in Noah's day. And Noah and those who were righteous were rescued. He reigned his wrath in Lot's day. Lot was rescued. And Sodom and Gomorrah was destroyed. And so when God decrees, he's going to send his angels and they're going to do his bidding. And, you know, the wrath of God awaits this world. God has never poured out his wrath upon this world like he's going to pour it out. Why? Because God is patient. He's long-suffering. Remember what Peter said, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So now let's get into the text of Scripture. Revelation verses 1 through 3. After this, I looked and behold, a door was opened in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was as it was of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. Now notice that. You might want to underline it. Things which must be hereafter in your copy of the Scripture. And immediately I was in the Spirit. And behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. And he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone. And there was a rainbow round the throne in sight likened to an emerald. Now, first of all, notice very clearly what John says. He's immediately transported into heaven to witness and to see. He's taken up by the Lord God himself and he is going to behold. He's going to see. He's going to literally experience. Now, it's interesting when you read the word see in this text. The word for look means to literally see like I am seeing you. I'm gazing at you. And, uh, you know, it's the same word that was used when the uh, wise men came to Bethlehem. And uh, when the wise men saw the star that led them to Bethlehem, they looked upon the star. They gazed upon it. And John is caught up. He is caught up by the divine hand of God to come up and to see. What's he going to see? He's going to see the very throne, the very throne of holy almighty God. So he saw a door open in heaven. You know, it's interesting while there are a lot of churches that have their doors closed to Christ, God had his door open for John to come up. And, uh, you know, the, he said, I heard a voice, a trumpet as of a trumpet. Now you remember the voice of a trumpet goes all the way back to Revelation 1.10. And it was the voice of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so God is calling John up into heaven to, to see the things that will take place. And so, what are the things that are going to take place? Well, it's what I mentioned a moment ago. It's the wrath of God. Everything that's going to come on the earth is the outflow of the wrath of God. There is going to be absolute devastation. There is going to be absolute death. There is going to be tremendous, tremendous... I mean, it's going to be beyond any human description you can describe. If you want to try to, uh, you know, try to explain what a thousand hurricanes would be like and then another thousand hurricanes behind them and then another thousand hurricanes behind them and then another thousand hurricanes behind them, you would begin to get a touch of the wrath of God that is coming upon this world. So John declared, he said, I saw and beheld a throne and one that sat upon that throne. Now the throne in this passage of scripture, it's not a piece of furniture. Don't you get in your mind's eye that he's seeing the Lord God sitting on a throne. That's not the picture. What does the word throne literally mean? It carries the the reality of the sovereignty. The divine authority of the universe. 
John makes it very clear. He's in the throne room of the sovereign of the world, of the universes of universes. And so John has been transported. He's been transported. By the way, this is the third heaven, as I mentioned to you this morning. That's where the holy of holies is. That's where God himself, the very outflow of the very holiness of God. And so the throne of God is talked about, but John is privileged to see it. And whenever you look at it, John gives some explanation of what he's seeing. John said, compared the one who sat on the throne, if you'll notice on the overhead, Jasper. Now notice, what in the world does Jasper have to do with? Well, Jasper, John very well knew what Jasper represented. It. Wonder, brilliance. John said, I looked and I beheld the brilliance and the wonder of his majesty. Carrying the meaning of just that brilliance and that glory. Carries with it the idea of reflecting colors in a spectrum of, of so many different ways. Exquisite, beautiful. Now, for all the saints that have entered into the very presence of God, they've, you know, they've already encountered the Lord, but John is ushered into the throne room. The countenance of God, John said, shone like a jasper. In other words, John is trying, as I said, to give the best language in his vernacular as he can share. And he said not only that, he was like a sardine stone. Now, folks, this is very intriguing because the sardine stone represents the justice of God. You know, you hear some people say, well, you know, I want what's coming to me. I don't. Do you want what's coming to you? I don't. I want, and I thank God I have the mercy of God applied to my life. Because the Lord says, as I shared, whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And I am saved. What are you saved? You, you know, we talk about being saved. What, do you, what, what is the reference to being saved mean? I am saved from something. I love being saved from the wrath of God. I love being saved from the fury and the eternal doom. There is no way I can die and spend eternity in hell. Why? Because the blood of Christ is applied to my life. God cannot violate his word. That's why if you're a child of God, his wrath won't be upon you. That's why God could not destroy Noah. That's why God could not destroy Lot. Because they were righteous people. And they had reverence for God. And they believed in the coming Messiah. And so the sardine stone. But then emerald. Emerald is a hue and multicolored rainbow. That surrounds the throne of God. Do you see what John is saying? He said, what I, what I saw, I'm putting it in the best words I know how. But it's almost impossible. Have you ever been someplace... And it's beyond human description. And here's the only way you can say it. You're just going to have to go there and see that. I had the privilege some years ago to go to St. Petersburg, Moscow. Russia, rather. Just north of Moscow. And I had the privilege to walk through the Hermitage. The Hermitage is, and the Louvre are the two leading uh, artist uh, arenas in the world. And as I walked through the hermitage, I would see paintings of Rembrandt. By Rembrandt, and not copies. These were not copies. And I stood as close from here to right there of a sculptor by Michelangelo. And as I looked, I beheld it. And some of those pictures are beyond words for me to describe and, and what I experienced. And I would say you need to go there someday, but it's a little piece to get there. But... I've tried to explain it. There's no way words adequately fail me. And I know that John is probably frustrated, but he's telling, using the best words in his language in that day to declare what he is seeing. He is like a jasper. He is like the sardine stone. And he's like an emerald. You know, you remember that uh, a rainbow, what a rainbow was in the Old Testament. God gave Noah a rainbow. Do you realize that there are three covenants in the Bible? Three basic covenants. Maybe more than that. There's an eternal covenant. Eternal, eternal covenant that you and I have. It's called the Noahic covenant. What does it mean? Every time you look at a rainbow, what do you know? This world will what? Never be destroyed with water again. Don't mean it won't be destroyed. But it won't be destroyed with water. And every time you look at that rainbow, I remember when I was a kid, I'd say, Mom, what's that rainbow for? And she'd say, well, son, don't you remember? In Sunday school, you learned that Noah got in the ark. 
And God spared him. And after he got out, God said, I put my bow in the sky. Well, the bow was a rainbow. In other words, it's a covenant. And I love this because it's also a reminder, our God is a covenant-keeping God. What does that mean? He keeps his word. Whatever he says, that he will keep. And so, you know, John makes it very clear. Here is an emerald. And, uh, you know, and so he makes it very clear. The church will disappear from the earth, transported to heaven. And so, at the completion of the church age, we're going to be gone. But John says, I saw, I saw a bow around his throne. And folks, there's no human language I can give you that adequately describes the revelation. Because the angels are there. They're covering their faces for the glory of God. But look at the next text. And round about the throne were four and twenty seats. And upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting, clothed in white raiment. And they had their heads, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. Now, John said, I saw four and twenty elders. Now, this has been a subject of a lot of discussion. Some say, who in the world are the four and twenty elders? Well, let me remind you of what's taken place. Remember, the rapture has taken place. The church is gone from the earth. There is one group of, in heaven that makes a complete set, and that is the church. You know, not all of Israel is, you know, with the Lord. But the church is gone. The complete church has vanished from the earth. So what's taking place? Well, if you'll notice something, those that are sitting near the throne, they honor and worship the Lord. They're resting, completely satisfied. They're given position and rank, according to other texts of Scripture. And their rulership cannot be taken away. So who are the 24? Well, the 24 was symbolic in the Old Testament. It was the Levitical priesthood. 24 represented the entirety of the Levitical priesthood. I think there were 24 sets of two that would serve, uh, you know, before the Lord. And so, you know, some say they're reserved for the 12 apostles. Some say they're reserved for the 12 patriarchs. Some say, think these seats belong to the angels. But here's what. I honestly believe in understanding and interpretation. This is representative of the church. You say, Pastor, why do you say that? Because there's only one group that's complete, that's in heaven. Who is it? As I said, the church. What happens after you and I are raptured? You realize we forget part of that? We look forward to the rapture, but what happens after your rapture? Do you know? You're going to be rewarded. When you're raptured, the seven years that are taking place, the fury and the wrath of God upon this earth, that seven years you're going to be rewarded based on your life. The Lord is in the process of rewarding His church. And so that seven years. And so Scripture makes it clear that we're going to be rewarded. We're go- and the Bible says in verse 4, they had on their heads crowns of gold. Man, imagine you being rewarded by the Lord Jesus and Him calling you forward and Him putting on your head a crown of gold. Because you've been faithful to what he called you. You've been faithful to his assignment. I believe with all of my heart that's a reference to the church. You know, the Bible doesn't completely say who it is. But there's only one group that is there that's complete. And that's the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Notice that they sit surrounding the throne of God. They cast their crowns before the throne of God in Revelation 19.4. And we've got some songs to that effect, don't we? You know... Better than carrying and wearing your, thro- your crown is to lay your crown at the very feet of him who saved you and redeemed you. And they worship the Lord God. As a matter of fact, a little bit later on, one elder is encouraging John to weep no more. You'll find that in a little bit later text. And one elder brings the progress report of the saints. And then one elder explains part of the vision to John. So the church is taken up. The church is rewarded. The church is in the very presence of God. And we're complete. You remember in Revelation 19 that the Bible says there's going to be a marriage supper. You know, we're preparing real good at our church. We have some good suppers. Now, I don't think you're going to have to bring a meatloaf or bring chicken, although we've got some great cooks and some good meatloaf and some good side dishes and some great desserts. Well, there's going to be a marriage supper of the Lamb. We're going to be a part of it because we're the redeemed of God. We're going to gather. Now, how does all that play out? God will make it clear at that time. But look at the awesomeness of God's throne. 
And out of that throne proceeds lightnings and thunders and voices. And there were seven lamps of fire burning from the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne, there was a sea of glass like in the crystal. And in the midst of the throne, round about the throne, were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. Now, notice what John is declaring. He said, out of that throne proceeds. In other words, out of that throne, out of that throne room of holy God emanates all the lightning and all the, all the thunder, everything and all the majestic voices. But I want you to notice the lightning and the thunder. What does that refer to? It literally refers to the righteous fury to come. You see, a lot of people say, well, this world is going around by random chance. This world has never gone around by random chance. Every single microsecond of this universe has been ordered by holy God. All the fury and all the, all the things that are going to take place, the hailstones, all the plagues that are going to take place, they are ordered and they are decreed by the sovereign of the universe. And our world is going to find out someday. You know, they are God's judgment over a sin-filled world. Do you ever wonder sometimes, you may be say, Lord, where are you? Why do the wicked seem to increase and the righteous seem to be tormented? Can I give you an answer to that? The grace and the mercy of God. Because when his fury starts, it will not stop. You probably watched that movie, Indiana Jones and Raiders of the Lost Ark. That last part of it is so intriguing to me in studying the revelation. You know why? Because that... Ark of the Covenant is uncovered and the wicked people just put their hands down in that ark. And all of a sudden the fury of God comes out of that ark. Even it's a motion picture, but it shows you the fire and the fury and the doom of God. And it literally goes through every one of them and it burns them to pieces and they're incinerated. And that lid is put back on the ark as though nothing had ever happened. That's Hollywood. But that, they give you just, that gives you just a little, a little snippet. The lightning and the thunder revealing God's righteous fury. And folks, God is a righteous God. He's full of fury. As a matter of fact, you know the Bible says he is angry with the wicked every day. He wants them to come to repentance, but don't you think for one moment they're going to get by with a single thing. And if our lives were not covered by the blood of Christ, we would be doomed too. And so look at the seven spirits of God. What are the seven spirits of God? That's a reference to the Holy Spirit. Seven, y'all go all the way back to Isaiah. Uh, I can't remember what chapter, but refers to the completeness and all the wisdom housed in, the, in all the functions of the Holy Spirit. But literally the, the Holy Spirit, which are the seven spirits of, of God. You know, you stop and think about it. The voice of God caused the sun to stop. The voice of God caused the moon to stay. At the word of God, every unbeliever, every demon, everything under the sun is going to be dealt with. And they're going to enter their eternal doom. At the word of God, God will undo this universe as he created it. Now some people think, well, you know, this world is going to go on and on. You talk to a person who don't know anything about the Bible or who, you know, is an atheist or agnostic. Well, this world's going to go on and on. No, it's not. I shared with you just a few Sundays ago or last week. How this world is going to come to an end. This world is going to blow up with a fervent heat. Fervent means severe and intense. One in which all the atomic structure in our universe is going to come apart by the word of God. So it's the Holy Spirit who's come to bring conviction. That's why it's so important for us to be about our Father's business. You remember what Jesus said, I must be about the business of him who sent me. I must be about my father's business. That's what you and I must be about. Why this world is going to come to an end. And God is showing through John how it's going to happen. And so, he says, the sea of glass. Now, this is not a literal sea. There is no more sea. But literally, it is a sea of crystal pavement. That is hard for you and me to believe. Imagine you got your car out there on the interstate and it was crystal pavement. Sometimes we're fortunate to get blacktop sometimes. And then you hit a pothole. Somebody said, well, you know, and, you know, bust a tire or bust two or three tires. But that's what it means. It's literally crystal pavement that serves as the floor of the throne room of God. And I go back and I think about my mother's, 
my mother's vision. She said, I looked and I saw leaves on the tree. They were crystal. You know, God loves purity. Amen? He loves pure worship. Don't you think that the floor of the throne room of God, how glorious and wonderful, crystal pavement, not water, there's no water. But imagine you could go to the ocean and as far as you could see, that water was crystal pavement. Imagine if all the Atlantic Ocean was crystal pavement. If all the Pacific Ocean was crystal pavement. If all the Mediterranean, the Indian Ocean and all that, if all that was crystal pavement, it would be amazing. Well, Scripture says the throne room. And how big is the throne room of God? Well, how big is God? He has no beginning. He has no end. When we go out of this world, out of time into eternity, it is an eternity of crystal pavement. You say, explain that. That's as far as I can go with my little old mind. But that's what John says. It's a crystal pavement. And then the four living creatures. Notice what it says. And before the throne, there was a sea of glass likened to crystal. And in the midst of the throne, round about the throne, were four beasts full of eyes before and behind like a calf. And a third beast had the face of a man. Fourth beast was like a flying eagle. The fourth beast had each of them six wings. They were full of eyes within And they rest not day or night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. And when those beasts give glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne, who liveth forevermore. Now, John makes it very clear. He said, I saw before the throne and before the sea of glass and before the crystal sea, around the throne I saw Four beasts. Now, let me explain in the original Greek text what the word beast means. We have such a misunderstanding because it's not what you think. The four beasts literally translates in the original Greek language four creatures. And these four creatures, they're angelic beings. They're before the very presence of God. As a matter of fact, they're guardians of God's throne. When you stop and think about it, you know, just as we have guardians of the tomb of the unknown soldier, we have guardians of the White House. We have, God has his holy, majestic, angelic guardians over his throne. And the Bible says they're always near the throne. The Bible says they have six wings and they're full of eyes. In other words, carries the idea of comprehensive knowledge. These majestic, glorious beings, they're full of comprehensive knowledge. And he said, third, they're function has to do with the holiness and wrath. You're going to see in the latter part the wrath of God executed through his angels. By the way, in Indiana Jones and the Raiders of the Lost Ark, you'll notice something in that ark, what happens? When they raise the lid, it's a most beautiful angel that appears before them and they're excited and all of a sudden that angel appears in wrath. What's God say? Even in that simple movie, God's making it clear his angelic beings are full of wrath. In other words, they're going to execute divine judgment on the face of the earth. They're going to do the bidding of God the Father. And so their function has to do with holiness. They declare the holiness day and night. As a matter of fact, the Bible says they cry holy, holy, holy. You know what the word holy means? Holy means literally high and set apart. You know, God is not like you and me. God is high and lifted up. You know, His earth, He supersedes His earth. Earth has no bearing over God. You know, I mean, God has always been, is, and always will be. This earth, according to some of the best biblical scholars and scientists who are God-honoring men creationists, it's about six to 8,000 years old, not 20 million years ago. I sort of get tickled when I hear somebody say, 25 million, million years ago. Really? You know, best we can estimate. Who is back there to tell you? Nobody. So anybody can say, now, 25 trillion years ago, this is what happened. Because there's nobody around to disprove it. But do you understand that the, there is no evidence in biblical record that this world is over probably six to 8,000 years of age. It's just not there. And so the characteristics of these four living creatures, like a lion, in other words, they're powerful. 
These angels, by the way, did you know one angel has the power to kill 186,000 people? You go back to Chronicles and Bible said the angel of the Lord had told how many. It was 186,000. The angel of the Lord. Do you know what the Lord says about the angel of the Lord to you and me? The angel of the Lord camps around those who fear him to deliver them from evil. That's what the Bible says in Psalm. Do you realize you have around you all the time the angel of the Lord who has the capacity to take out anybody if he wants to under the direction of God? And that's exactly what John is saying. He said, these angels, they symbolize power and strength. That's why he uses a line. Have you ever pulled up anything on on, uh, YouTube and uh, just watched the, the power of a lion? I mean, they're vicious and they're swift and they do their bidding. Well, that's, Scripture makes it very clear. And then like a calf, symbolize that they render humble service to God. These angels are not high and lofty and they are humble servants of God. They are created by God. Now, do you realize angels are a little bit, I don't want to say envious because that implies sin. But there is something about you they cannot figure out. They would love to figure it out. The Bible says they long to look into salvation. An angel has no concept of knowing what it is to be saved or lost. And by the way, no human being ever becomes an angel. One fellow talked about his wife one time and said, Honey, I just want you to know that you're an angel. He never complimented her a day in his life. And finally, she thought she got a compliment. She said, Thank you so much. And then he went into his usual form. He said, Yes, you're always up in the air harping over something. Now, Scripture makes it very clear. Angels are God's servant to do His bidding. The Bible says they, you know, whenever it comes to this passage of Scripture, they are humble servants. They're created. And by the way, an angel, you know, demons, all the demons of of hell at one time were holy angels. Did you know that? God never did create demons. Not one demon has been created by God. They are fallen when they fell with Lucifer. The Bible doesn't give you all the extent of all that, but they are fallen. And an angel cannot be saved. An angel is either glorifying God or they're following Satan. There's no in-between ground. But he said, they have the face like a man. In other words, they're rational beings. You know, as God created you, God created angels. Angels do God's bidding, do God's work, and they are going to be unleashed at the end time to serve the wrath of God. Like a flying eagle means their service to God is swift and complete. You know, I mean, as a matter of fact, you may have encountered an angel. You know, God says to you and me, be careful, entertain strangers. For in so doing, some have entertained angels unaware. One time I picked up a man on the side of the interstate. And he was the most unusual looking man. And we got in the car and we started talking and... He was talking about things that, and he was a very humble person. Didn't really have the greatest looks, but very humble man. And I got off the interstate at exit 25 and was going to Daniel's to work back in that day. And I asked him, would you mind if I had a prayer? And uh, he said, no, don't mind at all. Very cordial. And I bowed my head to pray. And this went through my mind. Just as sure as I'm standing here, don't be surprised if he's gone. I wasn't scared in the least. As I was praying, I have to be honest, I sort of opened my right eye to see if he was still there. Because God says entertain angels for it, so do some have entertained, or entertained strangers, some have entertained angels not knowing it. What does that mean? An angel can be in human form. Now an angel is not a human being, they're housed in human form. And so, that's what John is making very clear. And he says, they're like a flying eagle. They render service to God. And they're full of eyes. Now, if you tried to draw something like this up, it'd be horrific. And that's why a lot of people... But the word eyes simply carries, they're full of knowledge. Comprehensive knowledge. They know what to do when God gives them an assignment. There's never an angel up in glory saying, Now, Lord, what do you want me to do? They know what their assignment is. You remember... One of the things, they're to gather the unredeemed at the end of the age and they're to gather them before the Lord. That's what God's going to do whenever he he concludes this world. And then it says, they cry, holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty. And saying, which was and is and is to come. 
In other words, they cry, they call out the holiness of God. They declare the majesty of God. There is no angelic being that's taken God for granted. There is no angelic being referring to God as the man upstairs. And by the way, if you ever do that, ask God to help you to stop it. Now, I don't want to hurt your feelings, but I want to tell you what you're doing when you're doing that. You are cursing. You say, now, wait just a minute, Pastor. I'm not cursing. Cursing is taking God's name in what? When you bring God down to your understanding, you are taking God in vain. You're taking God lightly. And so they cry, holy. And I mean, they, every single angel of God takes the kingdom, takes the will, takes the plan of God seriously. And then... When these beasts or when these angelic beings give glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne who lives forever and ever. I love this. Let me tell you why. Our God never retires and nothing is ever out of his control. Sometimes we say things, man, things are getting bad. Oh, they're not going to get near as bad as they're going to. You just hold on as we walk through the revelation. You've not seen bad. You just hold on. This world is going to absolutely be decimated under the fury and the judgment of God. That's why Paul says we have been saved from the wrath of God. And he made it very clear what the wrath of God entailed. Paul knew. He said, I knew a man who was caught up. And so John is making very clear. And then in verse 10 and 11, the casting of crowns in worship. Look in verse 10 and 11. The four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that lives forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. When you and I get to glory, we're going to understand the completion of why we were created. You're going to receive your eternal assignment. Do you understand you have an eternal assignment? Based on your degree of faithfulness here now, some of you are not going to have the assignment that others do. There's not going to be the same rank and the same command in heaven as some do. Why? Because some are not going to use their life and their time and their energy wisely. But when you and I get to glory, the reference there, the four and twenty elders, representative of the whole church, representative of the the priesthood, which we are the priesthood of believers, they fall down in humility. Think about it. To know that you're one of the redeemed. You know, if, if you had a last name by like Vanderbilt or Kennedy or Rockefeller, you would have a privilege, unlike many others, on this earth. Do you realize you're going to have a privilege unlike many in the universe? When God calls you up and the eternity of eternities, He gives you His glorious assignment for your life. We was talking today at lunch about the mansions. You remember Jesus said, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house. Whose house? In God's house. What size of mansion does God make? Well, one reference is a dwelling place. We was talking about in my Father's dwelling place are many dwelling places. What is the earth? It's a dwelling place. Let me raise a question to you. Do you think God has a planet for you to rule over? No, I've just got a 20 by 20 house. No, you're talking about the sovereign of the universe. I love to watch some of these shows that are like rich and famous. I get excited. Let me tell you why. I don't get excited because I can afford anything like that. I can afford to watch it on TV. That's what I can afford. But that's what people who have gifted hands can build. Imagine what our gifted eternal God has built for his redeemed. 
And we're going to bow before him and we're going to cry, holy, holy, holy. But that's not going to be all we're going to do. God has eternal assignments for you. Let me show you how I can tell you that. We don't like to be still, do we? Okay. Thank those two of you that answered. You know why? We enjoy using our body. We enjoy using our mind. At least a lot of people do. Some don't. God, you're not going to sit in an eternal church service and listen to me preach for a thousand years. Please don't say amen. You're going to use your God-given glorified body and you're going to rule over part of the universe that he is going to make. How do you know that? Because he said so. We're going to work. And that's part of the text in Revelation we're going to cover. But we're one of the things we're going to do. We're going to bow before him. We're going to know, think about it. You're going to be in a glorious eternal body. You're going to be in a glorious eternity. You're going to be before the God of gods, the King of kings, the Lord of all creation. And you're going to bow gladly and willingly and delightfully saying worthy and holy is your name. Aren't you glad you're going? I'm so glad that one of these days I'm going to have that privilege like John to see the glorious throne room of God. But you will too if you're a child of God. And God makes it very clear. He has the power to do it. Now everything that we're going to read from here on in Revelation 5, 6 and when 6 comes it's going to escalate. God gives chapter 4 to say don't worry. Everything is happening. is happening out of the throne room of God. When you don't have a clue what's going on and when it looks like the world is out of control, everything is in perfect, complete control by the God of the universe. He knows what he's doing and he's bringing everything to an end. How can he do that? Because he can see the end from the beginning. Matter of fact, he saw the end from the beginning. And John is writing things that we may experience in our lifetime. We may not. But what's getting ready to take place? Because this world may very well come to an end. Even before we leave our, this world, I mean, we may be raptured and then starts the process. So don't be worried. Don't be overwhelmed. And don't be overcome. Because you and I are the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's going to catch us up. He's going to cheer us up. He's going to reward us. He's going to give us eternal divine assignments. And we'll know that completely when we're in His presence.